Hey, Sue Franz. Hey, Garth. Let's do this. Uh, why don't you and I uh, do a season of episodes where we talk about teaching? Now, Garth, when we have these conversations, would it be okay if I had a beer while we talked? I would assume that unless people are out there driving, uh, that they are also having a beer with you or a beverage of choice if they don't drink alcohol. That'd be fine. For those who do, definitely encouraged. I can see some people choosing a nice um, a nice herbal tea. We're going to get this thing out before the end of 2020 because we know that people need something fun and entertaining to listen to. And I hope that we can not only offer uh, some good teacher talk, but maybe have some fun doing it at the same time. Well, you and I are going to have fun. Now, whether anybody enjoys listening to us have fun, I, that I can't help you with. Well, that's the truth, Sue. You and I have had a lot of fun over the years talking about teaching. It's a passion of ours. And to tell you the truth, I don't like to think about teaching just in my own little bubble. I really love the teaching community. I think you do too. You value that. It's one of the things that I've learned from you. And so uh, what do you say uh, we go on this journey together? I think that's a fantastic idea, Garth. Join us for season one of Psych Sessions, Garth and Sue Talk, textbooks, exams, student workload, integrative themes, and so much more. It is a bingeable listening experience and it will premiere on Thanksgiving Day, Thursday, November 26th. So grab a drink and come join the conversation. This episode of the Psych Sessions podcast is sponsored by Pearson Revel, which I think is a game changer for students and teachers. I started using Revel a few years ago, and I can't imagine going back to what I was doing before. Revel helps me feel more responsible as an educator, knowing that my students are receiving evidence based learning experiences like retrieval practice. The single best thing about it for me is that it gets students to read. Do you know how long it's been since I've said to a colleague, my students just won't read the book? Yeah, Revel helped me solve that problem. And with that out of the way, I have all kinds of freedom to design the course I want. Now, I assign readings from the text with a click of a button that is delivered to my students as a tracked assignment according to whatever date I schedule. Revel is fully digital and highly engaging. It also has a mobile app that allows students to read, listen, or practice on any device. And students truly like it. So do yourself a favor. Check out Revel. Psych Sessions listeners can try Revel out for one term at no cost to your students. For more information, please email revel at pearson.com or visit go.pearson.com backslash Psych Sessions. Hello, and Wix Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Eric Landrum, along with Garth Neufeld, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff. This is episode number 104. I had the opportunity to interview Michael Wertheimer from the University of Colorado Boulder in Boulder, Colorado, with special guest host Doug Woody from the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley, Colorado. Before you hear the interview, please allow me to share some listening tips in my favorite moments. Now, I have to tell you this. There are times before you do an interview, and Garth and I have done about a hundred of these now, as you can tell, that you think about this could be a historic interview, meaning that you get a chance to record some of the oral history of psychology and There's no doubt about it. Interviewing Michael Wertheimer is one of those opportunities. Not only is he a key contributor in the history of our discipline, but his father, Max Wertheimer, is the founder of Gestalt Psychology. So the opportunity to talk to Michael at 
93 years old is, for me, really, in this context, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And we're so thankful to Doug Woody, who worked hard to arrange this with his friend and his colleague, Mike Michael Vertimer. So let me just give you some highlights. There's so much richness and context for you to listen to. I think we figured out that Michael was a divisional president for APA for five or six divisions. He was APA Division II president. I don't think it was called STP yet in 1966. Got to meet him in person in 2018 at RMPA. When he talks about his education, his post-secondary education, he talks about his bachelor's degree at Swarthmore, his master's degree at Johns Hopkins and his PhD at Harvard. And he, to be honest with you, he talks most fondly, at least in my opinion, about his undergraduate days at Swarthmore and some of the um, salon type honors instruction that he had in his junior and senior year. And I'll let you listen for that and make your own conclusion about that. But the seminars that he had found it sounded just fantastic. He actually has, to be honest with you, what I thought were very negative opinions about his instruction that he received both at Johns Hopkins and at Harvard. However, he runs into and studies under incredibly historically significant figures at Harvard. So, for example, he's a teaching assistant to E.G. Boring. Now, if you're a student of the history of psychology, in 1950, E.G. Boring publishes a very important book called The History of Psychology. Michael Wertheimer also serves as a teaching assistant while he's at Harvard in the 1950s for this fellow there called Fred Skinner, or the rest of the world knows him as B.F. Skinner. And so, Michael has incredibly rich stories that he can tell about his own personal experiences. And as you will hear in his own words, they weren't always the most positive experiences, as many of us shared in our own graduate school experiences. He, His career and his father's careers did not overlap. His father was considerably older than Michael, and right around age 14 or 15 for Michael is when his father passed away. He did, Michael did, however, grow up to uh, co-author a, a biography of Max's life. We did get into a little bit of a discussion about a, a tiny bit about imposter syndrome and Michael's prolific leadership skills across multiple divisions and associations. And for a little while there, I, I thought he was going to go with luck. Thankfully, he didn't. I was glad to avoid that conversation for once in the podcast. But it was interesting how he described uh, the Quaker approach that he learned about growing up of uh, problem solving and leading meetings and the issue of coming the other, I'm sorry, the approach of coming to consensus and how that approach takes a little bit longer, but how he found that it was highly successful for him in his leadership pursuits. Doug uh, was very astute in bringing up some topics that I didn't know about, which is one of the great reasons to have a guest host on the podcast. And so we talked a little bit about work-life balance and how uh, Michael was able to bring his children at different points in their childhood and developing adulthood into uh, not only outdoor pursuits of leisure, but also scholarly pursuits, including helping him work on books. Towards the end of the interview, Michael talks about a graduate school experience that was very telling with the famous researcher Donald Hebb and some correspondence that they shared. And then they we really close on a conversation about the importance of international travel and really Michael's love of languages that you hear him really really foster and develop growing up in Germany and then coming to America with English not being his native language and then how he picked up and studied, I think, probably dozens of languages over his lifetime. This really turned out to be a delightful interview and I, I pr so much appreciate uh, Michael taking the time to get on Zoom and Doug arranging this and it's just really fascinating to hear someone who's really one of the legends in the entire history of our field chat about ideas that, quite honestly, there were moments of this podcast interview that I didn't really understand the self of selves and some some very high-level ideas that were just delightful to listen to and try to absorb and be challenged by those ideas. I certainly do hope that you enjoyed this as much as I did. 
The Psych Sessions podcast is brought to you by STP, the Society for the Teaching of Psychology. STP members can view on-demand content from the recent annual conference on teaching. Visit teachpsych.org and look for the link under recent content. And are you on the job market or seeking applicants for an open position? Visit STP's job posting site at teachpsych.org backslash job postings. Of course, STP offers all of these things and more. Please become a member today. Eric and I think it is well worth the $25 a year, which includes the journal Teaching of Psychology. Thanks. You won't remember this, but uh, we chatted briefly after your 2018 talk at RMPA, the teaching talk that you gave that that I thought was just lovely. And so, um, but you've talked to 200,000 people in your lifetime, so I wouldn't expect you to remember oh, that. So. I assume you've met this other fellow on the screen. Yes, indeed. We've published together for that matter, too. Have, have that, you? That talk in 2017 or 18, uh, he turned into a version which was publishable. That's right. You collaborated on that. I, I think I did some gentle arm twisting after the fact because <laughs> it was a talk about teaching and teaching has been a big part of your career, hasn't it? Oh, yes. And I, I know at one time you were president of Division Two, if I recall. Is that, yes. is that correct? Yeah. Um, so I think we're just going to jump in. My at the time was teaching... Uh, 1966 psychology in 1966. That's when you started. Yeah, no, that's when I was president. Oh, 1966. Two, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I reviewed some things about your career, and well, we're we're just going to jump around. I hope that's okay, okay with you. Sure. Uh, when I ask people about um, when I hear they're going to retire, I've started to ask this question: Are you going to really retire, or are you going to fake retire? <laughs> and and Michael, I think you have fake retired because well, I I just saw that you've published a book this year, right? Two, you two books. Oh, I'm sorry, two just books. Out now is uh, this one just I just got the copy, June twenty third, a brief history of psychology, sixth edition. Oh my goodness! And then in January came out my uh, autobiography, facets of an academic's life. Oh my goodness! So, so you, th you're a great example of the operational definition of fake retire. Well, that's one way. It's de jure and de facto. All right. I'm sorry. I've, you're been, to I've been retired de jure for decades. De facto, I think, as of two weeks ago. <laughs> uh, I, 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 is that really true, or do you have another project you, that you're that you're working on with Doug? Not working on with Doug. There's a possibility of uh, some more stuff with my daughter, who's been very helpful in uh, all of my, especially recent book projects. Uh, K.W. Watkins, who has a, she graduated from Swarthmore College with highest honors, uh, one of three people. I graduated from there many years earlier with high honors. She went on for a master's in English at the University of Colorado, realized she couldn't get much of a job after that. Was going on at CU, went on to Yale for a PhD in English. Uh, Dan has been a wordsmith ever since and has helped me on an awful lot of projects since. I, I suspect uh, my... Me, uh, there, there's a couple of projects I make with her. One is called Cultural Aspects of Language, which would be uh, a version of a seminar, undergraduate and graduate, and I... Uh, offered the last 10 years or so that I was uh, still working officially. Um, that might still turn into a book. I'm not sure. With her. Uh, another one is a cookbook of all things. Been on the back burner for I don't know how many decades. I have a feeling that collaboration with your daughter is a mutually beneficial relationship. It is especially beneficial to me, but she always <laughs> that something. That makes it all worthwhile for her. You, you mentioned that you were president of Division Two uh, back in 1962, and I, I remember. 
I, I'm sorry? 66. 66, thank you. Um, and you were at uh, the University of Colorado Boulder, I believe, all of your professional career. Is that correct? Oh, I spent three years at Wesleyan University in Middletown, oh. Connecticut, from my PhD in 52 until 1955, and then have been at Colorado ever since, although I spent a year sabbatical at APA in 1970 as acting administrative officer for educational affairs, I think. Very interesting. I, I wanted to ask you, you know, I, I, I think you're well renowned for a lot of things, including your research, but it was, it's clear that teaching was important to you as well. Very much so. What, was, was that a hard sell for you amongst your research intensive colleagues or did they easily accept it from you? Or was that seen as a, were you seen, was it looked upon as why are you wasting your time with all that teaching stuff or was that not the case for you? Uh, not really. Uh, it didn't contribute much to my reputation with uh, my colleagues, but it, I don't think it deterred from it. What did deter was uh, committee work. <laughs> The usual, you know, officially it was 40, 40, 20 percent of your evaluation for uh, research, teaching, and service. But uh, de facto, at least in places like the University of Colorado, came something like uh, uh, 80 or 90 percent research, and or even more uh, for getting outside funds and a negative contribution for committee work service. Yeah, the the forty forty twenty is kind of a fantasy. I, I think it's usually more like sixty sixty fifty. It, it doesn't really ever add. <laughs> I think it's more like uh, let's see if it's research publication that used to be higher than it is now. Maybe now it's about thirty or forty. Getting outside funds is uh, sixty or seventy or eighty or ninety, and uh, service is minus the rest. Get it back down to a hundred. Doug, what were you going to say? I was going to ask if you'd be willing to talk a little bit. What are the, you notice that this is a transition from the 50s and 60s, the increasing emphasis on... I hardly hear you. Let me scooch a little closer and try that again. That's okay. Um, since the 1950s or 60s, you know, you noted that the emphasis on grants has grown substantially. Oh, yes. What are, what are the consequences of that for universities? Um, substantial. Uh, I don't know about the universities, but about the faculty members. I know for me, uh, my marketability was much lower than that of some of my younger colleagues before I retired. And it meant that they were getting uh, substantially more um, advantage from uh, their marketability than I was from my non-marketability. Salaries were higher, they got tenure more quickly than most other people, and so on by getting outside funds. And, well, I guess that's part of the uh, article that you and I were involved with too, Doug. Uh, the universities are becoming uh, much more business oriented. Uh, they are considered to be uh, not uh, institutions that support important social benefits, but money-making enterprises. And uh, one result of that is that faculty and staff are not getting the kinds of emol emolument increases that they used to get, while there are there's a proliferation of administrators who in turn end up getting huge improvements in their emoluments uh, as a function of how much money they can help bring in. And you end up with these enormous debts on the part of students because so much of the tuition goes to these, from my point of view, unnecessary administrators who are getting through this. You're talking about students and being in the classroom. Um, when you were in the classroom, I'm thinking about the one of the two books that you published in 2020 compared to the zero books that I've published in 2020. <laughs> um, the History of Psychology book. Um, did you teach History of Psych in the classroom when you were back in the classroom at, uh, at, at Boulder? Oh yes, I think I did that for almost every, almost every semester. Certainly every year. I I suspect, and if I'm wrong, I will apologize. I suspect not only did you teach it, but you you knew of it. 
uh, firsthand quite a bit, not, not only the longevity of your career, but the family lineage, so to speak. Was that well, fair partly to say? The family, partly the family lineage, but also uh, um, in graduate school, Edwin G. Boring was one of my advisors. I think I was a TA for him in history of psychology as well as introductory psychology as a grad student. And here at Colorado, uh, Carl Munzinger is very interested in history of psychology. Okay. And so, he's an excellent course in it. So I just want to back up a minute. So I, I, I'm not as much of a of an aficionado of history of psych as Doug is, but but I am a little bit, and I, I've taught the course here at Boise State, and I I do love the subject matter. So what you're telling me, sir, is that you were a teaching assistant to E.G. Bory? Yes, and to B.F. Skinner back at Harvard. Uh, now, I, I, I had done my homework and saw when you got your, your Ph.D. at Harvard, and I noted, yeah. and then I went back and looked at when he was at Harvard, and I knew there was overlap, and I did plan to ask you about that. So you were teaching assistant and took classes from both of those individuals. Yeah. Would, would you mind... I'm just going to shut up for a minute. Would you mind just chatting about what that experience was like and what those two gentlemen were like? Maybe I'll go back a little ways. Sure. I think what little education I got uh, after elementary and high school was at Swarthmore College as an undergraduate. Uh, the first two years, if you did reasonably well, you could so-called read for honors your last two years. And uh, what that involved was no more classes those last four semesters, hmm. but two seminars each semester, one in a major and one in either one or two minors, minors. Um, these seminars were taught usually at the professor's homes, um, once a week, uh, officially meeting from, say, something like 6.30 to 8.30, but the fact of starting at 6.30 and going off until midnight, small groups, as few as two who as many as eight or nine or ten sem in a seminar. Uh, you write a paper each week in each seminar. You were never graded by your profession. Right. Paid for a total change in the relationship between faculty and student. No more apple polishing, but instead you tried to squeeze your professors for whatever knowledge they had that you wanted in the subject matter. Uh, the last month at Swarthmore was hell. You had eight outside examiners. Um, a, you had a, a three-hour written and a one-hour oral for each of the eight seminars you had. And uh, after that ordeal, the group got together, decided whether you highest honors, high honors, honors, no honors, not even graduating, that kind of thing. From that to Johns Hopkins University, where I got a master's, don't like going back to high school. Where, I'm sorry, were you a psychology major at Swarthmore? Yes. I started out, I think, in uh, French literature and moved to linguistics. The third major declaration was philosophy, and the last one was psychology. Yeah. But then at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, well, Kula sent me there because I, he thought I had too many humanities and that kind of soft stuff. <laughs> Um, I got a master's at Hopkins um, to repeat. Well, they, they used uh, true, false, and multiple choice exams instead of essay exams, which I got used to at Swarthmore. Harvard was no better. Um, I did have some excellent instructors, Carl Lashley. Um, he was a brilliant lecturer without notes. Um, in the pro seminar at Harvard, um, Smitty Stevens, with whom I officially did my doctorate, um, Boring, um, Skinner. I never was taught anything about teaching, um, and I envy Doug. He had some experiences that as a uh, graduate student, and I think, well, quite aside from his own brilliance, the fact that he had that training helped him. I never had any. I got awards for teaching, and I still wonder how the hell I, I, I 
I'm always dubious about the effectiveness of my teaching. And the little bit of reading I did in the history of uh, uh, research on educational psychology, the lecture method is obviously the least efficient. And yet that's the one that's still widely used. And part of the article with Doug was that uh, instead of being forced to lecture, uh, those of us who were never trained to, and who are lousy lecturers, we won't be permitted to lecture anymore. Now there's going to be, uh, there already are these uh, online courses available with brilliant lecturers on almost any subject, far superior to that of most uh, tenured faculty members. That matter is another issue, the whole tenure issue. Tenure has been disappearing in parts outside of the United States and Europe, but also slowly, also eroding in the United States and Europe. More and more courses are being taught by underpaid outsiders who have temporary appointments. But I don't. But I don't think anything could replace those last two years that you had at Swarthmore, could it? I mean, no, nothing. Being in yes. faculty members' homes and small groups and yes, yes, yes. You know, that that salon kind of experience. That uh, and the sheer joy and excitement. Yeah. of, of uh, following where ideas lead, uh, going to the lab, doing some studies uh, that you think of that haven't ever been done before, even though they're minor, um, doing whatever it makes sense intellectually. Uh, that, it's exciting. I went to a small private liberal arts school in the Midwest in the 1980s. And Which one? Monmouth College in Monmouth, Illinois. Huh? And um, there were one or two professors who tried to replicate. It wasn't a, it was just a semester long experience, but they would invite us into their homes and it would be from seven to 9 PM. And we would have a small group discussion. And, you know, I remember these experiences 38 years later as, you know, someone trusting me as an 18 year old, 19 year old person into their home. And, you know, even though they weren't even psychology classes, I'm fascinated by your by your uh, litany through four different subjects uh, and landing on psychology. We're all, we're all glad that you did. And I have to ask you this, and I apologize for the memory quiz. Do you have any recollection at all who the author was of your introductory psychology textbook? I'm sorry to ask a memory question. I think my introductory psychology course was a Swarthmore. Uh, I think Kula taught it, and uh, I don't remember. I, did, I certainly remember uh, Boring Langfeld and Weld because I got to Swarthmore, uh, to, to uh, Harvard. That was a major introductory text back then. Uh, Cliff Morgan at uh, Hopkins also had an introductory uh, and, may and have used uh, one of Kuda's books but I'm not sure and one of the things that I just marveled as I was listening to your story Michael is that you know you're 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 tossing you're using names in the history of psychology <laughs> the way that that I would not so for example you mentioned a fellow SS Stevens but that's not what you called him you Stevie. called him by the name that you knew him right um even though I will I will use the name gently Fred Skinner I didn't know Fred Skinner I I know him as BF Skinner so um um Doug and I had matter, a, he uh, he insisted that his graduate students and other people call him Fred. Really? He was quite a, very nice. Can you but tell speaking me about, again of the honors business? Uh, that, that honors experience at Swarthmore also got me uh, very interested in uh, the honors program in psychology at the University of Colorado, which I ran for, I guess, close to 40 years. Um, wow. Found tremendously rewarding experience. The brightest students didn't need to bother. But it was a second tier who weren't quite sure of their own mm -hmm. abilities. And when uh, they were able to do reasonably well in a couple of required seminars, uh, design, carry out, uh, analyze, defend uh, a project for their thesis, 
uh, do reasonably well in final exams for honors, convincing them by golly that maybe they did have something. Maybe they could do it after all. That was so literally hundreds of years. Did you did you figure out over your time and experience the secret sauce of how to do that? Or did you have to do it individually per student? <sighs> It's a nice question. It was always individually per student, but there were certain principles such as respect, which unfortunately I did not experience at either Harvard or Harvard. Really? Could, could you talk a little bit? Do you feel comfortable talking a little bit more about that? Sure. At Swarthmore, again, in the honors uh, program, there was a uh, huge respect for, for, for the faculty. But the faculty also respected the students. And I had some fellow students in many courses that uh, one respected. That, well, as I mentioned, it's the form of uh, tests at Hopkins, multiple choice, true, false kind of stuff. That doesn't show a respect for the students. And while uh, at Harvard, from people like Stevens, Newman, Boring, um, Bekashi even, um, the fact that my last name was Wertheimer, back when my father's work was so far better known than it is now anymore, um, there was a little respect, but certainly not the kind of thing that you had, uh, that I had as far as more. You Somehow the idea was um, the, t the task of the faculty member to stick a funnel in the brains of undergraduate and graduate students and pour knowledge in. Gotcha. And let it come out of the mouth of the food and the fingers. Doug, you, you were going to say something? Certainly. You mentioned before in a Gestalt seminar that I got to take with you in 1995. Uh -huh. um, I had a wonderful time, and I'll, I'll say not only did I have a wonderful time, I learned a tremendous amount that still shows up in my work and my writing. So well, let me cheer for you as an effective teacher. Uh, you mentioned in there that. Um, Fred Skinner started his advanced behavior analysis seminars with an invitation to find something his theory could not explain. What were those experiences like, especially given your last name and arrival at Harvard in those circumstances? What was that like? It was a very sobering and interesting and educational experience for me. Yes, Skinner started his seminar by asking for any example of any behavior of any creature, human or otherwise, that could not be fully explained, whatever that means, by his uh, simple principles of reinforcement. And uh, all of us, class, oh, what a nice challenge. Of course, we'll come up with all kinds of things. We couldn't. Uh, once you got into the framework of uh, Skinner's behavioristics, um, that approach was able to count in a rational, rigorous way, or almost virtually any experience, behavior, anybody of any of us could think of. And uh, I guess it helped convince me that there is no single best theory of psychology as such, that there are different ways of looking at behavior and experience, uh, and that almost all of the ones that have been proposed have some positive features. And that a uh, really uh, prudent approach is to accept what's good and works, pragmatic kind of thing, uh, from almost any kind of theory. I, I, I promise we're going to stop talking about B.F. Skinner really soon. <laughs> I, 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 I think maybe this will be my, my last question. And because I think, I think you knew him well from what, what I can surmise. Do you think, did, did he really mean it? Did he really mean radical behaviorism? I mean, or was he just kind of winking at us and, and no, no, there's all this other stuff that we really can't see that, you know, there, there really is love, you know. I, it, oh, he, of course he agrees there is love. Did, did he, 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 this, was not, this was no pretense. He believed all this stuff. Yeah, okay. As I mentioned in my memoir, I still have a memory of his uh, being at a cocktail party at Harvard. And after two or three martinis, raising his class modestly and saying, psychology began with EFs.
I think okay. he was convinced he had the right way of dealing with it as a natural sign. What determines behavior? Past, current stimulus situation, history. Uh, you need very few concepts to do a proper natural science analysis of the subject matter of psychology. So, Michael, but before you got to Swarthmore, as as you're growing up, I if I did my timeline right, you you really didn't get to interact with your father as a psychologist. Ever, no. I think you were in high school when he passed away. Um, but clearly, his, his his career in psychology and the importance of Gestalt psychology and what he did uh, influenced your career. No question. Um, would, would you mind just talking about him and your relationship and, and what that meant for you personally and professionally to whatever, wherever you want to go with that would be, would be welcome. Well, when I was a child, um, he was a very warm, supportive, grandfatherly type of figure. Uh, he was uh, old enough to be my grandfather. My father. Um, I was unaware of his prominence in uh, scholarly circles until my early teens, I guess when I noticed how uh, revered he was by a lot of guests we had often for dinner at the house. As I also, Doug knows about this, so I mentioned in my memoir, um, I had a wonderful time at summer camp in New York and as a young teenager. Um, I was given the opportunity to be a junior counselor in the uh, summer of 1943, but by then I'd become sufficiently aware of my father's prominence that I naively assumed, oh, if I spend a couple of months writing his biography, that would be worth it. That would be so easy. I suggested it to him, said, oh, no, you counselor, you did. Um, and that October, he was gone. Mm. Um, I had become aware of it. So ever since he was, I was 16, I had intended to write his biography. I had finally did come out with uh, Brett King. I think in 2005 or 2007, something like that. And uh, I'm sure also having his last name helped me get into Swarthmore, helped me get into Hopkins, Harvard, helped me in my job at Wesleyan, even helped me get my job at CU, older. Um, and my chances are helped me get the various elective positions that I held with APA. I don't know how many decades I was president of some division or chair of some committee or board or something like that I was involved for many, many years with APA, partly because of my last name. May, may I? Sure. I, I have a very bad habit on this podcast of, hopefully it never comes off as arguing with people, and I certainly, respectfully, I don't want to do that with you, sir. But, Feel free to argue. Well, I, I don't want to do that. But it may have been that your last name got you noticed on a job application, yeah. or it, it got someone's attention. Unless faculty jobs have changed dramatically or APA division presidencies have changed dramatically, those typically are just given away by name only. There had to be credentials and skills and abilities and problem solving and decision making and I conflict like your resolution. Optimism. Well, the, for the very first leadership thing that you had done, if you had messed it up badly, I doubt if you had been asked over and over and over, <laughs> with all due respect. I think it was partly my experience at Swarthmore that uh, got me so often into the position of chair of various boards and committees. Uh, at Swarthmore, this was started as a Quaker school. By the time I got there, that was sort of a minor thing, but I've forgotten, it was probably the second or third semester that I was Swarthmore. Somebody, one of the, my fellow students suggested I go to a meeting. Well, there's a meeting house over there. I did the small square building, the interior of which is one big room with four benches around the center, several levels of, and a Quaker meeting. Everybody sits down, silence. Maybe silence for a full hour, or, or often, somebody would have some kind of a message that seemed worth sharing. Would stand up, speak for no more than a minute, brief minute message. Sit down. There'd be silence. Everybody would contemplate that for a little while. Maybe another related or unrelated message. A few minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes later, at the end of the meeting, the clerk shook hands with. Uh, the people next to the clerk, and everybody else shook hands. Um, there was some discussion of uh, joys and sorrows afterwards. 
somebody had a sorrow, like a relative who was ill, hold that person in the light for maybe 30 seconds. And there were various kinds of beliefs uh, and practices associated with Quakerism that I found very congenial. One is the idea that there's that of God in everyone, and that one's job is to try to bring that out and to try to help others around one bring it out of them. Another was the way to come to decisions in groups, not by vote, with the majority winning, but hashing it through enough so that everybody can come to the same unanimous conclusion about what's the best way to handle a given issue. Even in high school, Fieldston School, which is related to the ethical culture movement, I had a hour, a, a weekly half hour meeting, usually with no more than six or eight students, uh, all through the whole school year with an Algernon D. Black called Ethics. And in that half hour, the usual discussion was either some current issue, current event, not the best way to do that, to handle that, but what are the various alternatives and what are their pros and cons? And a critical thinking through. That I found similar to uh, this Quaker practice of hashing uh, a problem out with a all the different points of view uh, and listening to each other and then coming to a consensus that everybody could agree to. And yeah, I was chair of, uh, I don't know, education and training board, all kinds of boards and committees of APA and used that technique. It meant everything took a little longer. Usually there was enthusiasm and unanimity about decisions that were made. Well, I, Michael, I appreciate that because that, that, reveals a very thoughtful skill set that had been honed and practiced over time. And not that you just did things and got things because of your name. So, 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 so thank you very much. I, I, I want to, I've got one more specific question. I, I, I have not let Doug play at all. And I apologize for that. And I'm going to, I know he's got some topics that he wants to, to ask you about. I have this notion and I think it might've come from when I took history and systems in my graduate school training. Where was that? Uh, Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. This would have been in uh, 1987, 1988, probably. Remember who got uh, it? Uh, yeah, Jim McHose. He was the department chair. He had gone to the University of Iowa, and he had been around. Who would have been the? Uh, who would have been the the big name at the time at Iowa? It um, Spence. Yes, thank you, Spence. Uh, Spence and Taylor Spence. Yes, that combo. Yeah, Janet Taylor Spence, and then, yeah. Jim Spence. Yeah, thank Yes, of course, you know the names better than I do. Of course you do, because you knew them well, and you were best friends with them, of course. Um, but I remember this notion of there, there, there might have been a time in psychology, and it might have been in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, that there could have been a person at some point in that era who knew everything about psychology that that psychology was still young enough things were still coming out in small enough numbers in journals there were a low enough journal at least in the english speaking world of psychology i should qualify for that matter i remember at least in my earliest years i was a an enthusiastic writer to psychological abstracts and would actually read them covered yes. in the early years in the early 50s you you might have been that person because I I I think some I think forties and fifties somewhere in there, psychology was still small enough where six thousand articles a year might come out. And by the way, sir, I remember psychological abstracts because I would go to the library and page through, and the beauty of that was what our students don't realize now is that once I found my abstract. The one ahead of it and behind it was related uh -huh. to it. But now, when you zero in on psych info, no one ever goes one forward and one back. They Same go, kind of thing when you go into the stacks in a library. I miss the stacks. I miss the cards. 
uh, I do woodworking. I want to find those old card stacks and refurbish them and use them for something. I'm going to, I'm going to let, I know Doug's got some great questions. He well, I'm sorry ask. I interrupted you. Though. No, you did not, sir. I, I, I just, I, there's, I have this romantic notion that there was a, there was a point in time when a singular person could know everything or read every journal and know, know everything that there was to know about psychology. And then there was a tipping point and it got to be too voluminous. And well, the I don't tipping point I think came before I got my PhD in 52, although I was still pretending it was still possible. <laughs> okay. Obviously it wasn't. I Very did become president of the division of general psychology too. I think partly because of that division one. And Absolutely. theoretical and philosophical psychology and history of psychology, not to mention things of psychology. Yeah, one, two, twenty-six, and I don't know the other, the number for the other ones. Twenty-four and uh, and oh one. My good, oh my goodness, Doug, it's your Doug. turn. You've been very patient. Something that Eric may not know about you, like I know about you, is the experiences you've had in the mountains and on water and boating. How did you balance your family? your work life and the very, very important drives that are so prominent through your autobiography to be on the boat, on the water, and in the mountains and on the rock. How did you balance all of these different activities? It's a great question. Intuitively, I guess, is the answer. It was never fully successful. I don't think I neglected my kids all that much. They obviously were involved in these things too. Skiing, not so much rock climbing, boating too, very much. And grandkids and to some extent great grads by now too. These are all facets of an academic life, the title of my autobiography. And they uh, interact. Well, they're not independent. And even the work. My kids and grandkids have helped me with a lot of proofreading of stuff I published, for example. I mentioned my daughter helped me immeasurably, including making indexes for books and, and so on and so on and so on. I, I hope at some point in in your archives or in your family, you're going to share pictures. I hope you were big picture takers. Oh, there is no end of pictures. If you oh. take a look at my uh, the facets of an academic's life, all in a memoir published by Springer in January 2020, the uh, ebook version is a little cheaper than the paper, and it has some of the pictures in color. I think oh, there's over good. maybe some 400 or so pictures. Fantastic, fantastic. And again, those pictures were almost exclusively found by my daughter. She managed to find the pictures not only of places, but of people I, that I mentioned in there. She tried to get at least one picture in every fold of the pages. Oh, that's, that, that is awesome. Doug, what are we forgetting? I, I don't want to take too much time. I want to be <laughs> respectful about time. Well, uh, I do want to take a moment. I warned Eric I would ask you a William James question. That in your autobiography, you note many identities about father and brother and grandfather and great-grandfather and teacher and scholar and climber and boater and so on and so on and woodworker and other things like that. So. Eric may not know you share this connection. Is there a unified whole in this? I'm going to sound briefly Jamesian. Are you? Can you talk about a self of selves that transcends all of these identities? Self of selves? A self of selves, what James would call a spiritual self that transcends all of your various identities or integrates all of your various... I guess my answer to that is the same kind of agnosticism that I have about a, a theological question. Is there or isn't? there subjectively well yes yeah, sort of I mean, uh, there's a me that remembers all this stuff and of which each of these facets is a facet but uh, is there something like that i don't know how to point to it or how to find it or how to provide evidence for it uh, for that matter my epistemology is uh, empiricism and uh, rationality there's good evidence for something and good logical reasons to support something then that's good reason to start thinking it might be true that's would you that. character would you characterize yourself as a gestalt psychologist today what what camp would you put yourself in cognitive. you had to cognitive. cognitive okay very good cognitive psychologist uh, amateur and even more amateur historian of psych. I, again, I'm not so sure. I okay. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna be respectful and agree with you. <laughs> I I'm not so sure that's actually true. I'd like Gestalt an operational definition. Yes, I, I think Gestalt psychology still has a lot to offer, and it's being in a way rediscovered in places like uh, 
visual and cognitive neuroscience. Absolutely. Doug, Doug what else? I, I've totally dominated this. And I, <laughs> I feel a little bit bad, but not too bad because I've had a delightful time asking Michael all, all of these questions. So I'll, I'll say, Michael, that uh, uh, several stories in your book affected me very powerfully. I have described your interactions with Donald Hebb to more people. Oh, than that was people. such a beautiful experience. And I, I mentioned that to, to Eric. Eric no. Would you share that with us, please? Yes. Um, near the beginning of my being a graduate student at Harvard, John Beebe Center was a dollar a year man there. He was a, the inheritor of the Heinz 57 force. He uh, knew that I knew some German. He had read a uh, monograph by von Zenden about uh, summarizing the literature of people born blind who developed sight thereafter. Oh. And Hebb, uh, in his, uh, was it 1950 book, I think the Organization of Behavior, uh, had cited Zenden as, as providing evidence that learning is required to learn to see, that uh, it's not immediate by any chance. And the Beebe Center had read this book, and he said I mean, he wasn't sure that uh, all of the cases that von Zenden uh, discussed really supported that point of view and asked me to read it and see what I think. And he was right. Quite a few of the uh, examples, the cases in von Zenden's book indicated that certain kinds of visual recognition occurred almost immediately without learning. So he suggested I write a note for the American Journal of Psychology. BB Center was infinitely patient. He went with me over maybe six, seven, eight successive drafts, just the first page or so. This sentence implies such and so. Is that really what you mean? This word, is, it not really, is that the right word there? Haven't you said a bit too much about this here? It, you need to say some more about that and so on. Six, seven drafts or more. When we were finally satisfied uh, with the draft, he suggested I send it to Heb. He did, and Heb sent it back within a week with all kinds of excellent suggestions, stylistic and otherwise, but also strengthening my case against him. <laughs> and the integrity of that guy, unbelievable, published. Um, well, it, it was an extremely useful experience for the young graduate student that real scholars in the field would do that kind of thing, would help a graduate student strengthen a paper that was to be published against that person's theory. Well, what strikes me about it is that, of course, he knew the weaknesses in his own work as it was his work. But his generosity and sharing it and not being afraid to let the science speak for itself. Not only just not being afraid, but using it to strengthen the case, the, the case against himself. Unbelief. Yeah. I know we're being loose with the language, which is fine, but perhaps he didn't take it personally. Uh, no, perhaps it, it, it was the, he, wasn't, he was okay with it, the case against his work. And he didn't take it personally. The the case against oh, his theory, it yeah, his, which his so many of us values are right. the, the objectivity. What's the evidence show? Right, exactly. So, Michael, that, that that brings me to something that which oh, and by the way, I if I did I should have mentioned this at first. Hopefully, I did in an email. If upon reflection, if there's any of this you would like me to edit out, I will. So, yeah. so I would be happy to do that. And I may be coming to a question which which leads us to that. Um, you you know, the Heb story is one of these delightful surprises that you you've shared. So, I would ask you. Do you have any other people across the history of your career that just wowed you in a pleasant way? Uh, the one that jumps out is Robbie McLeod, Robert S. McLeod, sure. who uh, was one of my professors at Swarthmore, including on a seminar on language and thought, which I found absolutely brilliant, going and, which ended up with this uh, cognitive aspects of language that I thought at the end of my career. Um, he had a respect for knowledge, for students, for languages, for cultures, for scholarship. And I never saw any, anyone else. You need to learn some foreign languages, among other things, so that you can start to think in the way other people think. Um, and as an academic, you do have the obligation to do at least some uh, administrative work at some time in your career. Sorry. Department chairs and like that. <laughs> other things like that. Very modest guy, a brilliant scholar, 
wonderful model. You, you mentioned, uh, I, I keep saying I'm going to be respectful and stop soon, and I really promise I will. Um, I'm, I'm just having too much fun. I, I got I have to admit, um, you, you mentioned uh, just now the ability to uh, speak a different language and, and understand other people. Do you get back to Germany very often or have you not been back in, in a while? Do you still have a family home there? And again, these are personal questions that are none of my business. So last question. No, no family. I did get to Germany quite often during my career. And in fact, I gave the first Max Wertheimer lecture at University of Frankfurt when they initiated a, an annual lecture. Oh, that's, that's great. Frankfurt. Yeah. And I, I gave that lecture in the same hall that my father had lectured in. Oh, that's... Started off in German, but uh, just the first 10 minutes or so, five minutes, and the rest was in English. That, that's lovely. I, I studied... German in high school and a little bit in college, and I did have a chance to visit as as a young man, and so I I have not been to Frankfurt, but I have been to Munich and and other places in the south. But well, I I, I did get to Germany quite often. Not well, I guess the last time was maybe four, five, six years ago. I don't. Oh, very know. good. Yeah, I gave uh, again a, a celebratory lecture at the University of Wilsburg when they developed the art and archive of the history of psychology. And at Bielefeld, I gave one, I guess it was in 2012, on the occasion of the centenary of my father's 2012, 1912. But languages have been really fun for me. Obviously, my native language was German. I was sick when I came to this country. I had a wonderful experience in first grade, knowing absolutely no English. The teacher, Miss Eric, managed to get the class not to tease me, but to help me learn English. And within months, I was doing interpreting for my parents. I had some Spanish and French in high school, a, a one-year course in Latin Greek in high school, at field school. Monday was Latin, Tuesday was Greek, Wednesday was Latin, Thursday was Greek. It was enough interference. That I learned enough roots so that I, I became fascinated by etymology. Interleaving doesn't always work, does it? And then uh, uh, when my youngest son started going to third grade, they stopped having Spanish in the third grade. There was some talk of uh, skipping him or something like that, but for various reasons that seemed un unwise. I knew I was going to be going to Sweden two years hence for the summer. Uh, so he and I enrolled in a Swedish class at the University of Colorado. Of course he did. Nine, and I think he did better than over half the class. So some Swedish had one month's intensive one hour daily of Chinese just before I was along with Marilyn on a on to China with a bunch of librarians, some Portuguese, some Icelandic. Um, I just find languages an awful lot of fun. I like the old Sapir Whorf hypothesis. I think there's still a lot to be said. And it's a very useful experience to be competent enough in another language so that you can see the world through the eyes of that language. Different languages really have a very different way of categorizing human experience. The, the obvious things like uh, the second person, which is a, only a singular one, this in modern English used to have the and thou, that's gone. Uh, in Japanese, there's something like 30 different versions of the second person. And if you use the wrong, the wrong form, that can be quite insulting. Uh, the, the, even such simple things as I've mentioned, um, Doug has heard all of this stuff. So in mean, Spanish, the whole idea of agency is quite different. If I drop a cup and break it, the one who did that in English. Spanish? No, it's reflexive. Sucayo, sucayo, it broke itself. I have nothing to do with it. Stuff. And, and well, languages are fun, exciting, kind of a mirror of the culture. A absolutely, absolutely. It's been fun, they, thank you. It has been fun, it truly has. One little poem I wrote when I was a kid, I think it's uh, also in the autobiography. Use well your time. You have not much. I think we'll stop there. Thank you so much, Michael, Thank for you your both time so today. Much.